So welcome everyone to uh, We the Free Nuclear Free North uh, launch webinar. My name is Bernane Lloyd and I work with Northwatch. We're one of the members of this alliance. Uh, I reside in Nipissing Territory in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. And I would encourage everyone to put their introduction and their land acknowledgement into the chat box uh, as we get underway. So I'm joined by panelists from We the Nuclear Free North Alliance this evening. We're an alliance of people and groups uh, in Northern Ontario opposed to the transporting and the burying of high level radioactive waste uh, in Northwestern Ontario. We're opposed to the burial of these wastes uh, in any location and are very much in support and in solidarity with our, our, our friends and colleagues in South Bruce who are the other candidate area uh, at this point in time. Um, we're a fairly new alliance. Uh, we uh, launched uh, just a few weeks ago, and we began with a, a postcard, an information card delivered to close to 30,000 households between Uppsala and the Manitoba border. And our purpose this evening is really to share with you our primary concerns about the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's proposal to transport and bury highly radioactive waste. Uh, and uh, we'll be this evening uh, using this opportunity just to walk through these three primary concerns. Uh, there is so much uh, detail and so much material we could talk about this evening related to this proposal. We're going to keep it fairly high level uh, and certainly welcome your questions and comments uh, at the end of our presentation. And we expect that there will be others in uh, other sessions, uh, both networking meetings and uh, webinars for more opportunities to share uh, as we go through this uh, experience together. So just as context, the problem, the problem is that the nuclear industry through operating uh, nuclear reactors to produce, create electricity has produced uh, 3 million tons, 3 million bundles, over 58,000 tons of highly radioactive irradiated nuclear fuel waste to date. Uh, and they expect to double that volume over the next 30 years. Uh, that's their current projection. And the challenge is that these wastes are highly radioactive as well as toxic and must be isolated from the environment really into perpetuity. There's a couple of hundred different radioactive elements or ingredients in, in these wastes. And some of them, uh, are radioactive for a shorter amount of time, hundreds of years. Some of them are radioactive for millions of years, and they must be isolated from the environment uh, into perpetuity. So that's the challenge. Uh, and uh, for over 40 years, the nuclear industry has been arriving at the same response to this challenge, and that is to bury it. Uh, in the 1970s, three men for three months studied the problem and decided that the waste should be buried in the Canadian Shield in Northern Ontario. Uh, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, the proponent at that time, conducted a site search. Many in Northeastern Ontario and Northwestern Ontario are, are familiar with that, uh, that process and that investigation in Massey and Atacokan uh, and other communities. Uh, then the industry switched tracks and began developing a concept, an idea for geological disposal. And that was Atomic Energy of Canada Limited's geological disposal concept, which was referred for a federal review, uh, an eight year review, a 13 month hearing in five provinces. And at the end of that, the panel had one fundamental question, has the ACL concept been demonstrated to be safe and acceptable? And their answer was no, it has not been. And they made some excellent recommendations, including establishing an arm's length agency, arm's length from and independent from government and industry to take the next steps in the program and to develop a, using the language of the day, a framework for the participation of Aboriginal people developed by Aboriginal people. The federal government said, we thank you for your report. In principle, we accept it, but in fact, then did something very different and created through the Nuclear Fuel Waste Act, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. And in 2005, 
the Nuclear Waste Management Organization released their report calling adaptive phased management uh, the newest version of the ACL concept of the hair report recommendation to bury nuclear waste. And the site, one of the two sites that they are now looking at burying that waste uh, is the Revel Lake area between Ignace and Dryden uh, in the heart of Northwestern Ontario, in the heart of Treaty 3 territory and in the heart of Sunset Country. So the nuclear power utilities make up the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. We'll take a quick look at the players just as part of our, the final piece of setting our context. So the Nuclear Waste Management Organization is made up of those utilities that generate electricity using nuclear reactors and so generate radioactive, high level radioactive waste. It's Ontario Power Generation, Hydro-Quebec and New Brunswick Power. Uh, they have, a, there's a, a a federal regulator in Canada, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, some who have been observing the NWMO process might think that they are a partner to the NWMO. They are in fact Canada's regulator. They are to be arm's length independent and separate as a regulator, but they have a service agreement with the Nuclear Waste Management Organization and provide a number of services, including reviewing their reports in a bilateral process without public uh, without uh, public scrutiny or public access to that review. And uh, they travel to uh, NWMO studied communities and provide presentations, um, uh, hold open houses and so on, largely with the message that uh, this can be done safely. Safety, they say, is their first priority. Another important player, of course, is the federal government, the important federal government. They are actually the responsible party. They passed the Nuclear Fuel Waste Act in 2002. Seamus O'Regan receives the, uh, the current Minister of Natural Resources, receives reports from the NWMO, and then approves them. Uh, and under Natural Resources Canada, his department, there's something called the Nuclear Fuel Waste Bureau which to our best assessment and determination is a static website. And this under the Nuclear Fuel Waste Act was the agency that was supposed to engage with Canadians and provide oversight to the NWMO process. And clearly that has not, clearly that has not happened. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to two of our panelists, Paul Filto and Kathleen Skeed, uh, to talk about one of our three primary concerns, and that being consent. So, Paul. Uh, Paul, you'll need to unmute. Can you hear me here, Brittany? We can. Thank you, Paul. Go ahead. Okay, then. Yeah, the, Paul Filto, I'm speaking from the Fort William uh, Van Traditional Territory in the Robinson Superior Treaty. And I'd like to go over to the Treaty 9 territory near the Quebec border. The first time I thought about a willing host community or, or the idea of consent was when our, the, the township of Tech, which is Kirkland Lake, uh, passed a resolution and that they were to be a willing host community for Toronto's garbage. What you see before me is an old open pit iron mine. It's called the Adams Mine. And they wanted to transport the garbage from Toronto by rail 700 kilometers north and start filling up this one of a number of pits. With, uh, with the garbage. And anyway, our, uh, the township council said, well, we're a willing host. And I thought, well, hold on, I'm not too willing. And then the people in Boston Creek, uh, that's their, the Boston township, which is where the mine is located. They said, well, we're not too willing. And the other townships came on and they said, well, we don't like this idea. And eventually the farmers in into the southern part of Temiskaming that, that were in the watershed, both the uh, surface and groundwater, they said, well, we're not willing at all. And the, the opposition just began to spread right along the whole rail line. And I'd say the biggest difference between the, there's strong similarities between the Adams mine process 
and the one that we're following now. But the big difference is, is that the Adams mine was subjected to an environmental assessment before approval was given. The advantage of doing that was that we were informed hosts. In other words, the people that were sitting, that, uh, that, that were residing the citizens of this area that were to be affected by this project could attend the environmental assessment hearings and were given expert uh, testimony. There was peer review funding. And I would say that uh, we were, it, the, the project was scoped and there was some control over the discussion, but by and large, we were able to become informed. And uh, it took 15 years anyway, to, along to get the project stopped. And uh, anyway, we'll go on to the next slide. And I guess, you you know, we all heard of uh, uh, Greta Thunberger, Thunberger, <laughs> and she had the Vancouver teenage strike organizers helped organize the largest act of civil disobedience in the country. I think this gave us a lot of optimism. And we saw that our younger, our young generation is very concerned with our future. They're concerned about the environment. And we're making decisions about future generations that cannot give their consent. And indeed we are passing on a considerable liability. In this case, we're burying and abandoning the most toxic waste known to humankind in the water table of the Canadian Shield. Go to the next slide. Uh, I, I talked about what, what would be the ideal situation with consent. And uh, I, I came up with a definition of consent. I was thinking that if you went to the doctor and the doctor told you, well, you need to have an operation and the operation is life threatening, there's a good chance you're going to take an interest in the, in the subject. And so I would say in this case, if we're, we're dealing with a, with, a, with a threatening, something that threatens our health and the environment, then the type of conform, informed consent that we should have is where the, there's a clear appreciation and understanding of the facts, the implications and future consequences of establishing an underground repository of, for nuclear waste. And then I said, well, what would happen if, if any of the communities to be affected could have their say about what consent means to them. If a bo public body that is somebody at arm's length and independent, not the nuclear waste management organization, but genuinely a public body was consulted with the community, consulted with the communities and asked them what to consider, asked the communities and the participants what they consider consent to be. I think we'd come up with something very, very different from the process that we're in now. I guess, next slide. Finally, the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I think the first part of that is that we shall not impose undue burdens on future generations. States shall take effective measures to ensure that no storage or disposal, disposal of hazardous waste material shall take place in the lands or territories of indigenous peoples without their free prior and informed consent. And I think further, it's a contravention of the principle uh, number five of the atomic energy, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency. That is, we won't put any burden on future generations. And with that, I'll just move on to the next speaker then. Great. Thank you, Paul. And uh, we'll turn it over to Kathleen Ski. Kathleen. Oh, hi everyone. Bonjour, moi c'est Guy Jigo from the Gout. Dejna Kaz, Makwa Totem, Masomete, Nish Chiboimete. Hello everyone. I've been chosen by many concerned elders within the Treaty 3 area to speak on their behalf on this topic, as many do not have telephone or any other means of computer or internet access. They would like to bring forth the importance of the United Nations Declaration regarding free, prior, and informed consent. The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted by the General Assembly in 2007. In this declaration, there are 46 articles that declare rights of Indigenous peoples around the world. It underlines Indigenous rights to protect their culture, identity, religion, 
language, health, education, and community. You will notice that Article 29 speaks to no storage or disposal of hazardous materials to take place in the lands or territories of Indigenous peoples without their free, prior, and informed consent. The following FPIC are short shortened for timing purposes. Free refers to a consent given voluntarily and without coercion, intimidation, or manipulation. It also refers to a process that is self-directed by the community from whom consent is being sought, unencumbered by coercion, expectations, or timelines that are externally imposed. Prior means that consent is sought sufficiently in advance of any authorization or commencement of activities at the early stages of a de development or investment plan, and not only when, it need, when the need arises to obtain approval from the community. Informed refers mainly to the nature of the engagement and type of information that should be provided prior to seeking consent, and also as part of the ongoing consent consent process. Consent must be sought and granted or withheld according to the unique formal or informal political administrative dynamic of each community. Indigenous peoples and local communities must be able to participate through their own freely chosen representatives while ensuring the participation of youth, women, the elderly, and persons with disabilities as much as possible. Adopting and implementing the United Nations Decora Declaration was one of the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission of Canada. I just wanted to make those points on behalf of the elders that expressed their concern. Jimmy Glitch, for your time today. Jimmy Glitch, Kathleen. Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, item of primary concern relates to the scientific uncertainty, scientific and technical uncertainties uh, associated with this concept, this idea of burying uh, high level waste uh, deep underground. Um, it is a concept and it's a concept that the uh, many different jurisdictions, many different countries have been pursuing uh, for decades. In 1988, when the ACL concept review was beginning, uh, there was a report published that had 14 different countries had geological uh, repository programs. Uh, here we are 2011, uh, and no country in the world, no jurisdiction in the world has actually developed, had licensed, uh, and brought into operation a deep geological repository. No jurisdiction in the world has had a deep geological repository for fuel waste uh, get past the licensing stage. Sweden and Finland are in the licensing stages. Uh, Sweden uh, has been in the licensing process for almost a decade uh, with no approval yet. Uh, and uh, Finland is, uh, has an approval for construction, but have not yet submitted their application uh, for an operating license. So after so many decades uh, of effort, there is still uh, no success. But there are examples of certainly of, uh, of failed uh, geological repositories. There are also many examples of uh, the unknowns and the uncertainties associated with the uh, repository, deep geological repositories. And uh, uh, I would say that over the last 20 to 30 years, since the ACL concept review hearing, uh, there, has, there has been no retiring of the issues. Uh, it's simply that the issues have become uh, more detailed. And uh, so just a couple of examples of them, an, an issue that has certainly been front and center in the review of the Sweden, a Swedish repository is the issue around corrosion. Uh, and uh, the design that the NWMO has brought forward is that it will be a steel container coated with a thin coating of copper, uh, three millimeters uh, in one of their uh, post-closure reports, they estimate, the NWMO estimates, 
that uh, that uh, after a million years there would be two uh, two of those millimeters would be gone. These are very precise calculations uh, generated by computers over very long periods of time and high levels of uncertainty associated with them. In the Swedish review, it's been a very contentious issue. Um, the ability of the backfill to actually uh, retard the radionuclides as they uh, as they exit from uh, containers to either breaches or surface contamination, uh, the uh, we're often given a picture of the repository as if it's a, uh, a a dry space. The NWMO will talk about how water at depth moves so slowly. Uh, but in fact, for the design to work, it must become saturated. It must become uh, it, it, it must become water filled because the clay must have water uh, in order for it to swell, for it to act as a barrier. Then there's many, many questions about how that bentonite will actually work, how that clay will actually work in repository conditions where there's heat, there's gases, there's outward pressures, there's physical pressures, uh, there's the effect of the radiation itself. So there's many issues and uncertainties around whether that barrier will actually work uh, as a barrier. And then issues around those pressures that will, will, will be at play in the repository, heat, radiation, and the pressures of gas. Gas will build up in the repository uh, as uh, a result of corrosion and microbial activity in the rocks. And that pressure then can cause more fracture, more fracturing, more fissures uh, in the rock. And there's already an issue uh, before we even get to uh, the potential effects of those synergies of gas, heat, radiation uh, at depth. There's already uh, uncertainties around the character of the rock, uh, the degree to which it will be fractured, to the degree to which there will be faults and fissures encountered. And it's often described by proponents of deep geological repositories uh, that the rock that will be selected will have a certain integrity, a certain strength, uh, and so on. But uh, it may have that. Uh, it may be difficult to find that uh, because uh, Canadian shield crystalline rocks by nature are fractured. Uh, but if such a rock formation was identified, it would be very different as an undisturbed site than after it's been disturbed. Once you actually construct, once you excavate a series of shafts, three shafts, a series of tunnels, a number of uh, rooms off of those tunnels, it's a very, very disturbed uh, rock. Uh, there's lots of uh, potential for excavation damage, cracking and so on of the uh, of further fracturing uh, of the rock uh, that is housing the repository. And so all of those conditions work together uh, and create risk. Uh, risk, and I would say in the ACL hearing in the 1990s, we arrived at a point where it was no longer a debate about whether there would be releases from the repository. The question is, how soon how fast and what consequence? How those are the those are the issues. It's not a debate as to whether or not there will be releases from the deep geological repository. Um, so now uh, the site, uh, the map that you see on the screen is uh, uh, the area around the Revel Lake area that's being uh, investigated by the NWMO. And uh, that is this one of two sites that they're investigating as a potential uh, location for the deep geological repository. But it's not just the deep geological repository, it's a package deal and there's a packaging plant. What the NWMO refers to as uh, the surface facilities includes uh, a number of other features. Uh, it will include a waste rock pile, which will be uh, very, very high volume. There's the potential for a shallow cavern uh, there's no real criteria for when the NWMO would invoke that option, but the idea is that they would construct uh, a, a series of storage rooms underground should they choose to move the 
waste volumes from the reactor sites to the, their selected site before they've completed the evaluation process. So while they were still in site step eight of the nine step process, they have the option of moving the waste uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to their selected site. And then there's the surface facilities, which includes uh, in particular, the packaging plant where the waste will be taken from the containers that they travel to the site in, uh, and they will be transferred into the packages that will be the containers that will be uh, used uh, in the deep geological repository. This is a, uh, a an operation that gives very gets very little uh, uh, talk time from the NWMO, but is a real concern, uh, particularly for local communities, because that along with the uh, the fans from the repository will be real sources of uh, exposure to uh, radiation and exposure to the uh, radio contamination from the uh, fuel units that are being brought to the repository site. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Charles Faust, who is going to uh, describe uh, the location in the context of the, the watersheds in the region. Charles. Thank you very much, Bernadine. And um, Bernadine, I've asked Bernadine to, to uh, point with the mouse uh, if she can, uh, so that you can see as I go through this map, this is the only slide I'm gonna to speak to. Um, it's, this is a map that's compiled from data uh, that is made available by the National Hydrographic Network, federal government. Um, and, and it's a map, the purple lines show the uh, tertiary watersheds. Um, uh, in this particular case, in the area from Ignace in the uh, bottom left to um, the Winnipeg River into Manitoba in the, uh, on the right hand side of the map. So <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about is the problems with toxins entering a water course. With, it, this can happen through, uh, through surface flow or a groundwater flow. Surface flow is what we're mainly going to talk about here because um, it is easier to predict. Uh, the uh, groundwater is very, very difficult to model, uh, requires a lot of studies, and um, those, you, you know, um, those capabilities are, uh, you know, are, are expensive and, and uh, very specialized. So my, my concern is that this, ra this radioactive waste will be will be transported as soon as the permitting is, uh, is approved, if it's approved. Um, it'll take decades uh, to create the underground repository. So um, transportation will begin immediately and, and that material will be stored at the surface um, for a long periods of time. The, um, this, this is an opportunity when the the toxins can escape, as uh, Bernina suggested. So I'd like to talk, uh, this is a tale of three watersheds. The, uh, <clears throat> the Wabagoon River watershed is, highlight, is highlighted in, in red. These are flow arrows showing the direction of, of, the, of the river. Um, from the Revel Lake area, which is the red circle on the lower right um, near Ignace, about 40 kilometers from Ignace um, to the point up around where Grassy Narrows is, um, which is will come up later uh, about center. Um, so that, yes, um, where it joins with the English River watershed, which which leaves from Ignace and and flows north and west through Lac Sewell and the English River, joins the Wabagoon at Grassy Narrows, continues as an English Wabagoon. To, uh, to White Dog or Wab Wabasimung, where it joins the Winnipeg River that comes up from the south from Lake of the Woods. So um, the, the other uh, watershed that I'd like to point out is um, at the south end of the Rebel Lake study area, which is the Turtle River watershed connecting into the Rainy Lake the lake uh, and eventually Lake of the Woods and flowing out into the Winnipeg River, as I suggested. Well, all of these 
three watersheds feed into the, um, the Lake Winnipeg and ultimately the Nelson River and into Hudson Bay. Um, the, um, the study area that we're looking at at Rebel Lake, it actually spans two uh, watersheds, the, uh, the Turtle River and the Wabagoon. Uh, ironically, Ignace, which has the seemingly is the community from whom they're seeking um, the um, willingness, is not in that watershed. It's in the English River watershed. So any, any toxins that did enter a water course in the Rebel Lake area would flow away from Ignace, not towards it. The, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the case of the Wabagoon mercury dump. Um, many of you will have heard that uh, in, uh, this, is, this is one of the worst cases of toxins entering a river system in Canada. And it happened at the uh, Dryden Pulp and Paper Mill from 1962 to 1975 or 1970. Uh, approximately 10 tons of mercury were dumped into the Wabagoon River as effluent. Symptoms of mercury poisoning were detected in residents of Grassy Narrows First Nation, um, many kilometers downstream, uh, 120 roughly, uh, I think. In, um, so they were, um, symptoms were, were detected in residents of Grassy Narrows and in Wabasimung uh, in the late 60s. In 1970, a study found mercury levels 30 times higher than normal in the absence and the absence of fish uh, 64 kilometers downstream from the Dryden Mill, the point of entry. Uh, the, uh, Ontario government banned commercial fishing in, in Ball Lake, which is just north of Grassy Narrows and, and the Wabagoon River. Further studies link the symptoms of Grassy Narrows and White Dog with Minamata disease, which attacks the nervous system and was first discovered in Japan and, and caused by mercury poisoning. 50 years later, there's evidence that mercury is still leaking from drums that were buried near Dryden in the 1970s. Debilitating health effects continue to be felt. Other impacts of the destruction of a river system include the economic, social, and cultural uh, impacts due to the loss of employment, food source, and the traditional way of life. In, in summary, the point I'd like to leave you with is that once toxins are allowed to enter a water course, the impacts can be devastating far-reaching and irreversible. Renee? Great, thank you very much, Charles. Uh, we'll now move on to our, our third primary concern, which is transportation. Uh, and for this, I'm going to turn to uh, Dodi Legasic and Peter Lang. Uh, Dodi. Oh, good evening, everyone. Okay, um, this, the map that you have in front of you, the purpose of the map that you see there is to point out to you all of the um, nuclear reactor sites from which the high level waste will be transported in the form of the spent nuclear fuel bundles. And um, so what I want you to draw your attention to is the yellow column. And there you'll notice that the distances um, vary, uh, but uh, the greatest distance is from Point La Pro, that's number nine, which is in New Brunswick. And then the majority of the, um, of the reactor sites that hold about 90% of all of the high level waste are in, south, in Southern Ontario, that's numbers two, three, four, five, and six. And it's from that area, from, uh, from all of these reactor sites, but it's from that area in Southern Ontario that the bulk of the uh, high level waste would be transported up to, you see the orange circle just above Lake Superior, and that's the proposed uh, deep geological uh, site at Revel Lake near Ignace. There's also a DGR uh, proposed site in Teeswater in Southern Ontario. 
uh, in South Bruce. All right, so the first point that has to be made is that given these long, long distances that um, the NWMO has refused to really look into and the consequences of traveling these long distances is that this is a, a major issue that, um, that is a, a grave concern to us because the greater the distance, the greater the risk. So this is um, one of the risks that's, uh, that occurs uh, with the distances, and that, uh, that is a collision. This is typical of some of the transport truck collisions that happen, especially in northwestern Ontario. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, so we looked into the issue of collisions by taking just one nuclear reactor site that's Pickering, which is near Toronto, and uh, followed the number of collisions that uh, occur all the way up to Ignis. We've been doing that for the last 10 years, but this is the data for the last five years. And what, you, what I'd want to draw your attention to is the bottom of the uh, chart, where it says the totals from Pickering to Ignis. So the total number of collisions was 47,000 plus almost 48,000 uh, 48, um, total collisions from Pickering to Ignace. And out of those total collisions, 7,010 were uh, transport truck collisions. That in and of itself should tell NWMO that it's not a good idea to uh, transport the, uh, the waste out, out, out of the nuclear reactor sites. And the second thing I want to draw your attention to is the right-hand column. And you'll notice that the percentages of truck collisions versus all collisions um, is uh, climbs as you go down the chart. And then lo and behold, when you get to the part of the chart that's labeled as F, um, the uh, statistic, the percentages go from um, from 19% to 51.5%. So I want to I want to just show you that section of highway in the next chart of statistics. Next, please. So this uh, this uh, section of road is the uh, is about 200 kilometers outside of from. Uh, highway 1117, where it splits at Shabaqua uh, and it and goes up to Ignis, add on another 40 uh, some kilometers. And so this is the about a 200 kilometer stretch uh, that the transport truck drivers will have to endure um, as their last leg. And if you have a look at these uh, percentages, they are be just mind boggling. Um, and in, the 19, in 2015, it started at 46% and it's been climbing since then up to an average of 52%. If you have a look at 2019, it actually jumped to 66%. That means that um, that the percentages of truck collisions um, are increasing due to the lack of in infrastructure or the poor quality of the highways uh, um, in that route. And so out of the 712 uh, total collisions, 367 of them um, were uh, transport truck collisions. And we, by transport truck collisions, I mean the, the big rigs that we carry about a 35 ton um, UFTP, that's a used fuel transport transportation package, and, and it would be about 192 um, nuclear fuel bundles. Now you have to also remember that um, when, when you think of the transportation routes, that uh, from the very beginning point at the reactor site, um, the goods have to be transferred, the fuel bundles have to be transferred uh, right at the very beginning onto the U into the UFTP, and then, uh, then they have to go through the distances through many, many cities uh, and uh, provincial parks and all along water bodies that each have a watershed that we need to be concerned about. And then once it gets to the site, then it has to be transferred and, uh, at the Revel Lake site and it has to be taken off that truck. And then it has to go through a repackaging process in the packaging plant. So at each and every one of those transfer points, there is an element of risk and as the trucks are traveling, there's always low levels of, of gamma radiation being emitted. And so, um, so the concerns that we have in terms of transportation are distances, collisions, and what will happen at these uh, different transfer points. Um, now, uh, there's another form of transportation that NWMO sometimes refers to, and that's by rail. And so this is going to be covered now by Peter. Hello, um, 
happy to be here and uh, welcome everybody. Um, the slide you see there is from the Transportation Safety Board investigation. You'll see it down there, R20W0031. I'd urge all of you who are interested to look up and read that particular report because the extracts from it I'm going to mention. Um, the actual accident was in Emo, February 18th, 2020. Uh, the investigation was officially concluded and released July 28th, 20, after only five months. We have two derailments that have happened in Ignace, um, May 25th, 20, and June 17th, 20. And almost a year later, we haven't got the Transportation Safety Board final report. Anyway, with regard to the Emo uh, freight uh, derailment, there were 144 cars in a train almost two miles long with only two crew members in total. 33 cars derailed, 29 of them carried dangerous goods, and 28 of those were um, crude oil. And uh, they spilled 84,464 US gallons on Highway 602 and the rail bridge, as you can see. The significant finding, I think, if you read that report, is that the derailment was caused by something called ice jacking. It occurs when there's alternate freezing and thawing of snow and ice, uh, which kind of, it results in a kind of uh, pumping action, which basically separates the rail itself from the underlying rail plate and its base. So it'll leave uneven, unevennesses between uh, the left track and the right track. And there you can see a good example of the intersection where this other photo took place. Um, it's more, most likely to happen where the alternate freezing and thawing is accentuated by road salt, which is almost unavoidable. And when you think about it, um, it's, it's a, win a winter condition, which is likely to happen on Northern rail lines. Um, this report will tell you that. Um, one of the other very significant findings was that during the period that preceded this rail derailment, December 11th of 19 to February 16th, two days before the derailment of 20, there were eight inspections done. Light geometry, heavy geometry, ultrasonic, and visual. So despite these eight inspections, no defects were found. Defects, sorry. <laughs> defects weren't detected. So what can we conclude from it? If rail is chosen as one of the means of transporting nuclear wastes, high level nuclear wastes, it would be subject to quite possibly ice jacking. It's a whole Northern phenomenon and it happens from Sudbury right through to Ignis every winter. Um, it occurs most likely where road salt might be on the road or the rail bed. Um, and the third thing that's most important, I think, is that ice jacking is virtually undetectable. So I think this is a, a revelation that we've just learned. We don't know a whole lot more than that, but I think this is very significant and I think that we should take it seriously. It is a risk. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, and now I'm going to turn to uh, Wendy O'Connor, who is going to uh, walk us through some of the actions that we can all take uh, uh, in response to the situation we find ourselves in with uh, the Revel Lake area, having reached this final uh, shortlist uh, for investigation as a candidate a nuclear waste burial site. Wendy. Thanks, Bernine. Can you see me and hear me? We can. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Excellent. Um, before I get into uh, what we can all do and some options that we've listed on our website to give people some guidance on that, I just wanted to touch on 
the fact that there is an alternative, probably more than one alternative, but there are, are alternatives to burying this waste deep in the ground. So we're not just anti um, having a deep geological repository here in Northwestern Ontario. We're, we're pro some of the other options. And I was considering a, a site selection down near Teeswater and South Bruce and, and we in the North are not saying we don't want it here, keep it down there. And the people in Teeswater, our friends there are not saying, uh, you know, just put the idea of abandoning this. With the uh, uh, alternative that's been put forward, and I, I got some of this um, verbiage from Gordon Edwards, who I think has joined us on this webinar among the audience. Um, he calls the concept rolling stewardship and others call it responsible stewardship, but the general idea is that we don't just abandon this waste deeply into the NWMO literature. That act actually is what they're, they're proposing. Um, you know, if community would have some degree of response and fears, it's going to be there. So it's just stored at or near the surface, started across country, um, stored in secured engineered containers, containers, So we are having some newly monitored as it is today um, and periodically because aside from you're, you're not burying it in the ground and forgetting about it is that can you still hear me uh we're having difficulty your sound is in and out life in north can you hear me Brene? uh hmm. your sound is in and out wendy um maybe if you turn your camera off to get improve your bandwidth then we'll uh, and we'll we'll move along On our website, um, how's the audio now, Bernie? Is it improved? Much better, thank you. Okay. Um, on our website, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it um, can help. And of course, you can get to our website just by Googling We the Nuclear Free North, and you will find a link that will take you there. And um, up here, where it says you can help, it. it gives you a number of options that, that yourself on the issue and forming your own opinion this way to spread news not it always has been um but we have a few things to help you along next slide Bernie. one way a classic way um of helping with these kinds of issues is to contact the lead in your community and we've provided a list on the website of municipal leaders in our area website for chief and council contact information, um, a number of uh, ministers of the federal and provincial legislatures. So it's actually quite a long list. If you go onto our website, uh, you'll hopefully see links to the people that you want to contact. Um, we've even provided a little sample letter. If you were to click on where it's can use the text of that letter, which touches, so you can use it as a starting point. A lot of people find that helpful. Uh, next slide, please. I think this will be really popular. It has been when we posted it on Facebook and put a link to it. You can print out a poster and put it in your window or, you know, on, well, there used to be a back shelf in cars. You could put things on like this on, but um, you can contact us if you want a bumper sticker, but this you can print out in your own home and, and put up on your um, on your window or at your local bulletin board. So it's just a PDF, easy. You can consider a donation because uh, we are run by volunteers, but we need funds for materials, the website hosting, postage, that kind of thing, just to get the word out. It's easy to make a donation on our GoFundMe page. If you don't need a receipt, if you do need a receipt, we have a couple of nonprofit partners that will accept donations on, on behalf of our group. One is the Demeter Project and one is Environment North. 
and um, on the website now are various ways of contacting through, through those two organizations. You can sign our change.org petition, which um, now I believe has over 5,000 signatures. And um, that gives us an easy way to contact you with updates. And it encourages all of us that we're not alone in opposing this. And my last slide, um, we've provided a contact form, again, on that same page of our website. If you would like to make contact with us and, and propose something you can do, or you want to form your local group and need some guidance, um, anything at all, that, that form will, it's a way of introducing yourself to us and it's easy to use. So I encourage you to use that. And with that, I think I turn it over to Brennan for the discussion. Great, thank you very much, Wendy. And we are going to move to discussion now. I'm going to um, stop the recording.